Hello, this is Teach Philosophy, and I'm back after some time being away from YouTube, so I'm happy to be back. I am working on a logic book right now to be published in December of 2015, so what I would like to do today is to share one of the chapters with you, or parts of it at least, and this chapter is about fallacies. So I'm going to go over thoroughly 22 common fallacies from a philosopher's point of view. Okay, I'll give you an overview, examples, discussion, advice, and activities to help you recognize the fallacy. Um, in the next video, I'll go over formal fallacies, which I think are even more interesting because they're lesser known and in some ways more useful. Okay, so on the first slide, you can see some reasons to study fallacies. I won't go over all of those, but just remember that committing fallacies is not a bad thing. We're all human, and recognizing our fallacious tendencies and cognitive biases can make us even more human. All right, number one is the appeal to nature of fallacy. This is when we infer that something is good because it's natural or something is bad because it's unnatural. Now, the naturalistic fallacy has other meanings, but we'll just focus on this meaning for this video. Here's some examples. Many pe people argue that it's morally permissible to eat cows and pigs because it's natural. They usually argue it's natural because humans have the teeth for it, it's part of the cycle of life, or because other animals do it. Another example. Some people argue homosexuality is immoral because it's unnatural. They believe it's unnatural. And finally, somebody being silly might argue it's okay to throw poo or to steal because I saw monkeys throwing poo and stealing from each other in the zoo or something like that. <laughs> it's natural. Okay. Now, even if we could prove the naturalness, let's say, of eating meat, it would not necessarily be right. And to see why, think of the many acts that you believe to be both natural and immoral. For example, some biologists believe humans evolve natural predispositions predispositions towards rape and aggression and xenophobia, but it doesn't follow that they think it's morally good to aggressively rape or be xenophobic. I may be naturally violent, but it doesn't follow that I think it's good to act on those violent desires. I may be born naturally self-centered, but it doesn't follow that it's good to be self-centered. Or consider health. Poisonous berries may be natural, but it doesn't mean they're good in a health sense. Chemotherapy may be unnatural, but it doesn't follow it's bad. So in short, you think that some natural acts are immoral and some are moral. And that's why it's logically inconsistent to argue an act is moral simply because it's natural. Or that an act is immoral simply because it's unnatural. All right? Now, the vagueness of the term natural is another problem whenever you argue from naturalness. And, you know, uh, people disagree about what's natural, and we're constantly discovering more. But even if you agree that something is natural, this fallacy will most likely arise in your argument. So how to avoid it? Don't assume that natural is good or unnatural is bad or vice versa. So one activity I like to do with students is to use this column chart, two column chart on your screen, and on one side we put natural good acts, on the other side we put natural bad acts, and we make a long, long list. And then we create another two column chart, and we have unnatural good acts and unnatural bad acts. And we create a long list, and that really drives the point home. Now, some people miss the point here and argue that good and bad, morality is subjective, relative, whatever. The point, though, is that it's inconsistent for you to argue that goodness can be derived from naturalness alone, since you believe some natural acts are bad. It's a consistency claim, right? So, ethical thinking does involve reason given among intelligent people, and referring only to natural, natural or unnatural uh, reasons commits this fallacy. All right. Number two is the black and white thinking fallacy. This is a fun one. It's also called the false dilemma, false dichotomy, the either or fallacy. And lots of psychologists call it polarized thinking or cognitive distortions, right? And this fallacy arises when we illegitimately limit the alternatives available. So, for example, I might say you must be a Republican or a Democrat. You're not a Democrat, therefore you must be a Republican. <laughs> and, of course, the problem there is I limited it to two parties when really there's more. There's libertarians, anarchists, socialists, Nazis, whatever, Green Party. Now, the premise for this fallacy is common, right? Either support this bill or be unpatriotic. Either buy this car or be unhappy. Either vote for this law or be a Nazi. Either support all forms of abortion or be against all forms. Right? You must support either dualism or materialism. I need an A or my life will be ruined. <laughs> okay? um, so it's a very common fallacy, very simple. Now, it's important to remember that sometimes there really are limited options. For example, I'm either alive or dead. God either exists or does not exist. Right? 2 plus 2 equals 4 or it doesn't equal 4. Now, cognitive therapists, 
um, psychologists are very interesting because they call it polarized thinking and it often arises in therapy. For example, I might believe that I'm either a complete success or a complete failure, that everyone's for me or against me or that each person is entirely good or bad. The therapist can help me see how these fallacious forms of thinking cause destructive emotions and the Stoics also recognize this and were in a way the first cognitive therapists. So logical thinking is one of the keys to mental health. And you can see my 10 themes of stoicism video for more on that. So think about, to avoid this, think about each situation to identify whether there really are a limited number of options. Do not rely on emotion alone, which often sees in black and white. Um, and it takes imagination, right? Some people want you to believe there's only two options so that you'll choose their option because the other option is so awful <laughs> in their mind, right? Okay, number three is the ad hominem fallacy. Ad hominem is Latin for to the man, and this is when we try to disprove a conclusion by criticizing the person or the person's circumstances instead of their argument. So, for example, some argue that Catholic priests are pedophiles, so their beliefs about God must surely be false. Or your argument against eating meat is bad because I saw you eating meat. So this is an ad hominem fallacy because your hypocrisy has nothing to do with the logical structure and content of your vegetarian argument. It's also important to remember that an insult is not an ad hominem fallacy. The insult becomes a fallacy only when we mistakenly infer a conclusion from the insult. So for example, if I argue that Clinton's law is bad because he's a jerk who cheated on his wife, then I've argued in a fallacious way. The problem is his cheating has nothing to do with the law. In general, the problem with the ad hominem fallacy is that the attacked person's circumstances or actions do not usually affect the conclusion. And there's various types of ad hominem arguments. They're circumstantial, abusive, guilt by association, poison the well, to quoke, and so on. But what they all have in common is they illegitimately focus on the person instead of the argument. So how to avoid it? Well, you focus on the evidence and argument, not the person's negative or positive qualities. You can do that in rhetoric and persuasion, but if you're just sticking to logos, to logic, you want to avoid that. So some activities identify ad hominems in political debates, but remember an insult is not an ad hominem fallacy, an insult alone it has to be an inference there. And then think about this too, when is an ad hominem approach not fallacious? That is, when is a person's character or circumstances relevant to the conclusion? So, for example, in a courtroom, the character of the witness is relevant because the jurors need to know whether they can trust the witness's testimony. So focusing on character defects weakens any claim based on the trustworthiness of the witness. Okay. Number four, the genetic fallacy. This is very interesting. The genetic fallacy arises whenever we dismiss a claim or argument because of its origin or history. So I might argue, you can't believe Bob's idea because it came from his dream. Or I might argue that that's not possible because he got the idea from a science fiction film, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm dismissing these claims because of their origin. Now, I might say, oh, Pythagoras' theorem can't be true because he got it after smoking a joint. Well, that doesn't matter how it arose because we have a proof for his theorem. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, the genetic fallacy arises when a person gives evolutionary reasons. It often arises there to explain away beliefs. The problem is explaining the cause for the claim is usually irrelevant to whether the claim is true. So for example, let, let's say that there's evidence that belief in causation arose for evolutionary reasons. Now I would be committing the genetic fallacy if I argue belief in causation is false because it arose for evolutionary reasons. The evolutionary explanation is helpful in, in such debates only if I already have strong and independent arguments against causation. Let me put it like this. Let's say I deduce that all A are C, because all A are B and all B are C, right? Now, m my reasons for believing all A's are C's are the two premises in their logical relation. But the causes of my belief are neurons firing in my brain. Now, I don't want to confuse the two. <laughs> right? The relationship between reasons and causes is complex, but the point is, is that we don't usually prove or disprove a belief by identifying its cause. To think otherwise is to commit the genetic fallacy. So in short, to avoid this fallacy, focus on the arguments, not on the origin or history of the arguments. Remember that a bad source doesn't make an argument bad. Only false premises or a faulty inference from a logical perspective make an argument bad. Um, 
Now, why do people fall for this fallacy? I think it's because they usually confuse reasons and causes, and they confuse psychological and logical explanations, and they confuse sources, of course, with arguments. Okay, the fifth fallacy is the slippery slope fallacy, and this is when we argue that A will cause B, and B will lead to undesirable C. Since we do not want C, we shouldn't do A. Now, all slippery slope fallacies present a chain of reasoning in which the first step leads to the others, but there's no good justification that's given for why the first step will lead to the others. So, here's some examples. Um, humans will eventually be marrying trees and raccoons if we allow homosexual marriage. I must accept the existence of soul if I believe some form of dualism. Or from Stephen Law, if I loan you a dollar today, then you'll eventually ask me for ten dollars and then one hundred dollars. I don't want that to happen, so I can't give you this one dollar loan. <laughs> okay? And you can search YouTube for direct TV commercials to find other humorous examples of slippery slope fallacies. Now, it's important to remember that all the above examples are good arguments if there's good evidence for a why A will lead to B and B will lead to C and so on. It's only a fallacy if I do not give good reasons for why this slide will occur or if there's no good reasons for why the end of the chain is undesirable, right? So in short, not every slope, not every slide is fallacious, okay? Now, for example, if I push the domino, it will fall and hit the second, and the second will hit the third, and so on. That's not fallacious. In the 1960s, they debated about the domino theory and whether it would we should intervene in deep Vietnam. Some claimed it was a slippery slope fallacy, some didn't, right? So, uh, Sometimes it's debatable. Okay, fallacy number six is the argument from ignorant fallac ignorance fallacy. Now, ignorance here means not knowing. Okay, this fallacy arises when we illegitimately appeal to ignorance to support a conclusion. It usually takes the following form: No one has proven not a, therefore a is true. It may also take this form: No one has proven a, so a is false. Now, notice that this fallacy is not about an ignorant person. <laughs> Rather, it's when we mistakenly believe that something must be false because it has not been proven true, or that something must be true because it has not been proven false. For example, you cannot prove God does not exist, therefore God exists. That's the argument from ignorance fallacy, because I'm moving from a lack of evidence all right, to a claim about reality. And the lack of evidence is you cannot prove God does not exist, and I'm claiming, in reality, God exists. Here's another example of this fallacy. You cannot prove God does exist, so God does not exist. It's the same thing, because I'm moving from a lack of evidence to a claim about reality. Here's another one. You cannot prove vegetables are not sentient, so we should treat them as if they are sentient. Now, this is a really interesting fallacy, the argument from ignorance fallacy, and the video just before this one goes over it. So I won't go over it in much more detail, except to say that even very intelligent people fall for this fallacy, <laughs> okay? Um, and it's very interesting. Let's, uh, okay, on the next few slides, you have, you have some practice and some answers, so you can go through and pause if you want to do those. Let's do cherry picking. Cherry picking is the fallacy I am most guilty of, I believe, <laughs> okay? Now, cherry picking is when we look f only for confirming evidence for our ideas. So we ignore, suppress, do not see, or do not test for disconfirming evidence for our ideas. So here's some examples. A presidential candidate mentions all the cities where his tax policy decreased crime, and he fails to mention all the cities where his policy increased crime. Or here's another example. A survey of participants in a workout program gets very positive results because only those with positive results responded. Anecdotal evidence is often cherry picking. So I might cite my grandpa and say, of course cigarettes are okay. He's 90 years old and smokes a pack a day. You know? Now, cherry picking is interesting. It's also known as the seeking only to confirm fallacy, the fallacy of incomplete evidence, or in psychology, confirmation bias. And it's difficult to overcome, I know I do it, because we do it at both a conscious and subconscious level. Many studies suggest that we do not really believe what we see. Rather, we see what we believe, and then we seek to confirm our ideas in subtle ways. Now, being aware of this tendency is the first step in overcoming it, a little bit at least. To become aware of this tendency, 
You can study a book of optical illusions or paradoxes. And there's some other techniques you should do too, and I'll mention them in a minute. But to see how deep this fallacy goes, take a look at my video called An Introduction to Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. Okay? And it's really hard to overcome cherry picking, I think, because a lot of our ideas are not separate from us. They're like the lenses through which we see the world. So it's very hard, very difficult to question the lenses through which we see the world. Okay, now how do we avoid it? Study optical illusions and paradoxes. I think you'll start seeing things in more than one way and break free from rigid ways of seeing. Second, seek out all the data, not just the data that supports your belief. And this takes some imagination and emotional maturity because you have to imagine what would make your idea false and then go look for it. Think about what observations would make your belief false and then test for them. And if you can't imagine what would make your belief false, if it were false, then this is actually a weakness, not a strength of your belief. And you can check out my YouTube video called Falsifiability uh, for more on that. Now, here's a couple of questions. Why is the image of picking cherries used to describe this fallacy? Well, I think it's pretty obvious. Imagine picking all the red cherries and leaving the undesirable green cherries on the tree. In picking cherries, we are picking what we want. In cherry picking evidence, we only see the evidence confirming our position, the red cherries, and we suppress, consciously or subconsciously, the disconfirming evidence, the green cherries. Right? And so that is the cherry picking fallacy. Fallacy number eight is a group of fallacies that appeal to emotion either directly or indirectly. These are ad populum, appeal to tradition, apple polishing, outrage, guilt trips, peer pressure, and groupthink. Now, ad populum is Latin for appeal to the people or appeal to popularity. And it's when we argue that a conclusion must be true or good because most people believe it's true or good. The argument from tradition is closely related because it's argued a conclusion must be true or good because people have historically believed it to be true or good. And there's many, there are many related fallacies that appeal to emotion. So in the book Critical Thinking by Parker and Moore, they identify the following. There's the argument from outrage, which is inflammatory words followed by a conclusion. Right? Kind of like, dualism, silly, you don't believe it, do you? Or apple polishing. All right? uh, it might be, you know, only a very intelligent people like you uh, accept this claim. So you accept it, right? So you're apple polishing. You're calling me intelligent, flattering, right? There's guilt trips. You create guilt in people to force acceptance of a conclusion. There's peer pressure where you try to get them to accept a conclusion by giving them acceptance from yourself and others. And there's groupthink where pride of group membership causes the acceptance of some beliefs, right? Here's another example. Eating animals is moral because we have been eating them for thousands of years. Well, that's an appeal to tradition. And it's also an emotional force because Thousands of people have been doing this and think it's okay. That's a lot of <laughs> emotional pressure on me. Okay? Now, the problem with many of these fallacies is you cannot logically infer what is true from what people believe, feel, or want to be true. If everyone believed the Earth is stationary or was stationary, it wouldn't make it so. If everyone believes the Earth is moving, it doesn't make it so. If most people believe slavery is good, it doesn't make it so, and so on. So the best we can do is put aside emotions and examine the evidence. Now, uh, this is easier said than done, right? The truth is that most of us want to be loved and accepted, and so we feel enormous pressure to agree with these fallacious appeals to emotion. And it's really difficult to research every issue, right? And so we go with the herd, either subconsciously or consciously. I know that if I had lived 800 years ago, I would have thought the earth was flat and stationary. I mean, moving? That just doesn't make sense, <laughs> right? So our emotions and billions of people can be wrong. And that's the bottom line for this fallacy. <laughs> Number nine is the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. This is Latin for after this, therefore because of this. And it's when we infer that A caused B simply because A happened before B. So caveman Bob beat the wall of the cave and the sun reappeared. Therefore beating the wall of the cave caused the sun to reappear. Or here's one. My wife must be driving the car incorrectly because we never had transmission problems until she drove the car. <laughs> okay. Uh, one more. Since I began eating my boogers last month, I haven't been sick. Therefore, eating boogers is like getting a flu shot. Right? Now, it's important to understand that there really might be a causal connection between these events, but we can't infer that there is one merely because one event chronologically preceded another.
Now the post hoc fallacy is very similar to the idea that correlation does not imply causation, which you might have learned in psychology. So just because two events go up or down together doesn't mean they're causally related. Okay? Um, so for example, obesity and uh, number of hours of TV watched you know, might go up together, but it doesn't mean that obesity causes you to watch TV or watching TV causes obesity. There might be a third factor, like eating a certain food causes you to be obese and want to watch TV, or there might be no causal relation at all. So correlation doesn't imply causation, and with post hoc, just because something happened before something else doesn't mean it caused it. The next fallacy is the straw man fallacy, and this is when we misrepresent an argument so we can more easily defeat it. So just as a straw man is easier to knock down than a real man, a distorted version of an argument is easier to defeat than the actual argument. Right? So let's say my girlfriend told me to take out the trash, and I say, why do I have to do everything? If I spent my entire weekend doing housework, I wouldn't have any time to watch sitcoms. Okay. Now, this is like a straw man fallacy because I took her claim that I should do something and misrepresented it saying I should do everything. Here's one from class discussion. We were arguing about animal welfare and a student criticized the claim that we shouldn't kill living things when the original argument was we shouldn't kill sentient living things. So notice that sentience refers to an organism's ability to experience pleasure and pain. It's reasonable to believe a rock is not sentient, but rational people believe dogs, cows, and humans are sentient. So in short, this was a straw man argument because they were attacking the argument that you shouldn't kill anything living, whereas the original argument was you shouldn't kill any living thing that is sentient. <laughs> okay? So each student or each person in this group misrepresented and weakened the original argument Thereby, thereby making it easier to criticize. Sometimes we do this intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. Either way, it's a straw man fallacy. So how do you avoid it? Be charitable. Interpret your opponent's argument in the strongest way possible. Second, suspend your disbelief for a moment and try to believe what your opponent believes. And this takes some imagination and emotional maturity, right? Look for the strongest sources defending their position. Third, remind yourself that many claims are partially true. For example, it may be appropriate to raise taxes in City A, but not City B. So ask yourself whether their idea is applicable to some situations, but not others, and maybe they'll do the same for you. Finally, seek truth, not victory. You may still disagree in the end, but following these steps will help you avoid the straw men caricatures um, of these positions that you disagree with. Now. Yeah, and I think a lot of these straw men arguments are unintentional, right? So many do it unintentionally because most of us only see the data in support of our uh, positions. Go back to confirmation bias and cherry picking. And it takes a special effort to seek out and see disconfirming evidence for our views. So because of these bad habits, it's, e it's easy to misunderstand and then misrepresent opposing views. Okay, the next fallacy is the relativistic fallacy. And this arises when we illegitimately argue that nobody's incorrect because what is true for you is false for me and we're both correct. Okay, here's an example. 2 plus 2 equals 5 is true for me and false for you. Hmm. Try building a building with 2 plus 2 equals 5. Right? Or how about this? Water is composed of nitrogen and corn is true for me and false for you and we're both correct. So now, relativism is based on the idea that each culture or person creates their own truth, so nobody's objectively incorrect. Many people are drawn to relativism because they think all answers are equally good, since most philosophical questions seem to have no final answer. Well, this is false. Imagine arguing that the universe was created by a rabbit because we're not really sure how the universe began. The fact that we don't know, which is called skepticism, doesn't mean that every opinion is true or strong, which is called relativism. Now, some ideas really are relative. For example, green is my favorite color, may be true for me and false for you, and we're both correct. Or kilts are beautiful, may be true for me and false for you, and we're both correct because we believe beauty is in the eye of the beholder, or most people do. All right? Einstein proved that time is relative in a certain sense, and philosophers debate about whether morality is wholly or partly relative. And certainly not all ideas are relative, though, it seems. The relativistic fallacy arises when we apply relativism to objective areas, like math, science, and logic. 
And the fundamental problem with this form of relativism is that truth is not determined by what people believe. Truth is what is the case. Now, there's some deep philosophical issues here, okay? Um, but I hope it's clear that not all opinions are equal. It's fallacious to argue that my opinion is just as good as your opinion because they are simply opinions, or that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true for you but false for me. Such statements commit the relativistic fallacy because they confuse opinions with reasoned opinions. They confuse skepticism with relativism, and they confuse well-supported claims with arbitrary claims. So how do you avoid it? Well, remember that believing a claim does not usually make it true or good. Even if everyone believed it, that wouldn't make it true or good. Remember, too, that we studied logic, science, math, ethics, and many other fields because we believe there are better and worse solutions, true and false beliefs, valid and invalid arguments. And if crude relativism were true, like we're discussing here, there would be no point studying these fields because every opinion would be equally true or good. All right? So um, let me at, just ask these questions and to help you process some of these ideas. The first question, what is wrong with arguing that logic does not apply to me? And the answer is, it seems contradictory to use logic to argue logic doesn't apply to me. <laughs> okay. Number two, explain why the following claim is objective. God either exists or God does not exist. Well, um, yes. I may not know if God exists, but I know there are only two options, existence or non-existence. It's similar to saying that the table in that room either exists or doesn't exist. This is objectively true. Even if we can't open the door or see through a window to verify that the table is there, it's objectively true that the table either is or is not there. So the statement, God exists, is not made true because someone believes it's true, and the statement, the table in the room exists, is not made true simply because people believe the table exists. These statements are objectively true or false, even if we can't determine their truth value. Now, many people miss the point at first because they think everyone is right in matters of religion, but this is false. A person's belief can be incorrect even if nobody knows why or if it's incorrect. So, I don't know if the religious or non-religious folk are incorrect about God's existence, but I know someone is incorrect since God cannot both exist and not exist. So, um, let me ask one more question here. Does having an open mind mean considering all ideas or accepting all ideas? Now, I think it's best understood as considering all ideas. If you accepted all ideas, you believe the Earth is both flat and round. You believe it's best to invade Iran and it's best to not invade Iran. Surely you don't accept all ideas. If you disagree with me, then you just rejected my idea that you don't accept all ideas, and therefore you don't accept all ideas. I think open mind, having an open mind is considering, not accepting all ideas, fairly considering them, of course. And uh, let's move on to the next fallacy, absolutism. This arises, number 12, absolutism, when we make no exceptions for rules that have exceptions. So, for example, Bob believes you should never lie, so he tells the Nazis where the Jews are hidden. Or politician Paul knows his city needs a tax hike, so he begins to believe that all cities need a tax hike. Or Aiken believes hard work leads to flourishing, so he thinks starving children in Africa simply don't work hard. <laughs> now, we usually think absolutely when we seek simple answers for complex issues. The problem is, is many issues are complex and ambiguous, and the answer often depends on the situation. For example, hard work does lead to success, but there are situations where you will fail no matter how hard you work. For example, if you live in an impoverished and war-torn country. Now, there may be rules that do not have exceptions. For example, the rule that any imaginable entity either exists or does not exist seems to be an absolute rule. Those who study formal logic may be familiar with some absolute rules, but the point is that the absolute fallacy arises when we fail to make exceptions for rules that have exceptions. And most rules have exceptions. Okay, so how do we avoid it? Identify the exceptions for any rule. Also, be patient when exploring complex issues. You know, don't jump to simplistic and emotional answers. Okay? And again, I think people are drawn to absolutist thinking because it's simple, clear, and requires less effort. All right, a big one, number 13, begging the question or circular reasoning. To beg the question is to assume what we're trying to prove. So the conclusion is going to be stated or assumed in the premises. Here's an example. God exists because the Bible says so, and the Bible is true because it's the word of God. Well, maybe God exists, but this argument is fallacious. It's circular. 
Here's another one. I should knock you on the head because it's right and good to knock persons like yourself on the head. <laughs> the conclusion is just a rewording of the premises. Here's another one. Consciousness is physical because consciousness just is the brain. Well, that's circular. Maybe consciousness is physical, but not for that reason. That's just a uh, begging the question. And here's a funny one. Of course smoking pot should be illegal. After all, it's against the law. <laughs> one more. All knowledge is scientific because all non-scientific claims are not really knowledge. Now, I also will show an example of a very difficult argument that's begging the question. And I think it illustrates well how very intelligent people can commit this fallacy. So, an argument that begs the question is a valid argument, but it's trivial. So, for example, if I argue everyone is selfish because all people are always selfish, then the conclusion does follow from the premise. Everyone is selfish because all people are always selfish. But it only follows because the conclusion is simply a rewording of the premise. I've assumed the premises in the, I've assumed in the premises what I supposedly proved in the conclusion. Right? So the bottom line is you cannot assume what you're trying to prove. Right? Now, some people use this phrase in different ways. For example, some people mean by begging the question, a premise has been omitted. Sometimes people say it begs the question when there's a question that should be part of the discussion. For example, in discussing prayer in school, a debater might say, well, it begs the question as to what the First Amendment means. But in this text, in most logic texts, begging the question means are you in a circle or are um, assuming what you're trying to prove. So how do you avoid it? Make sure your conclusion is not a mere rewording of your premises and do not argue in a circle. Now I have two interesting questions here. Number two, try to construct an argument proving that you have free will without begging the question. <laughs> All right, now philosophers have presented some interesting arguments here. But most people present circular, begging the question arguments. For example, they say, I'm free because, look, I just freely raised my hand. Or, I'm free because I could have skipped class today. And some also confuse the different meanings of free, which is the next fallacy equivocation. But those examples are begging the question. Here's another one that's interesting, another question. Try to prove the external world exists without begging the question. Ah. Now, the external world is the world of people, tables, trees, cars, and other things that you believe exist outside of your mind. Now, I have not been successful in doing this. Okay? Many, all arguments I've seen for the existence of the external world beg the question because they argue or assume that our senses can be trusted without explaining why. Okay? And I made a video, Is the World Real? You can check that out if you want. Okay, number 14 is the fallacy of equivocation. This is when a word shifts meaning in an argument. So you see an example here. Feathers are light. What is light cannot be dark. Therefore, feathers are not dark. Notice how the word light refers to weight in the first sentence, but to color in the second. Here's another example. Something must be done. This bill is something, so this bill must be done. <laughs> Notice something can mean an effective solution or any solution. And there's a shift there. Now, equivocation is probably the most common fallacy of ambiguity. Ambiguity is where a word has multiple meanings. But there are other fallacies of ambiguity. There's amphiboly and accent and composition, division, and so on. Um, and those are interesting to explore as well. So this is a very simple one to avoid in theory. All you have to do is precisely define your words and let people know what those definitions are and use the same meaning throughout the argument. Okay. Now, some humorous examples of ambiguity are things like um, in, a mother of eight makes a hole in one, or kids make nutritious snacks. <laughs> All right, you have some practice slides there. You can pause if you want to practice, and the answer key will show up on the next slide. Hasty generalization is the next fallacy. Now, hasty generalizations arise when we illegitimately generalize from a non-representative sample not just a small sample, a non-representative sample. And they are the source of many stereotypes. So here's some silly examples. I met three redheads and they were all mean, so all redheads are mean. Here's another example. Everyone who responded to the survey said the exercise program helped them lose weight. Therefore, everyone who used the program lost weight. 
Now, the most common type of hasty generalization is generalizing from too small a sample size. So, for example, it's a hasty generalization to infer that all redheads are mean after meeting only three redheads, right? However, sometimes it is valid to generalize from a small sample size. For example, I can generalize that stoves will burn my hand after experiencing only one stove burn my hand. And this is good because one stove is usually representative of all stoves. So you should carefully examine each situation to determine if it's representative. Now, large sample size don't always protect you from this fallacy. For example, I might fallaciously conclude that most Americans support the Democratic president because a poll of thousands and thousands of Democrats recorded a 70% approval rate. Now, clearly this poll is not random and is not representative since it's only polling Democrats. So to avoid a hasty generalization, a large sample size is a good start, but it should also be random or representative. Okay? So how do you avoid it? Well, don't generalize from a small or unrepresentative unrep sample. <laughs> right? Take a, a statistics course. <laughs> All right, number 16 is the fallacy of composition. This is when we invalidly infer the quality of the whole from the quality of the parts. Here are some examples. Hydrogen and oxygen are dry, so water is dry. Right? Um, my organs are not conscious, so I'm not conscious. Each player in the team is great, so the whole team is great. My cells are not free, so I'm not free. And if we assume everything in the universe has a cause, then the universe as a whole itself must have a cause. So it's important to remember that it's sometimes valid to infer the quality of the whole from the quality of the parts. For example, every brick in the wall is white, and all the spaces between the bricks are white. Therefore, the whole wall is white. Right? Again, assuming that there's only bricks in the wall there, and all the bricks are white, this is a good, valid argument. You can move from the parts to the whole in some cases. Now, since these are all informal fallacies, you should be sensitive to each case and how the parts and whole are connected in each case, in the case of composition, right? So, how do you avoid it? Be careful when you infer the qualities of the whole from the qualities of the parts. Be sensitive to context. Sometimes the whole is more than its parts, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's debatable. Right? So here's some interesting questions. If the parts are physical, must the whole be physical? Hmm. Now this is a difficult and controversial question. Some say yes, and they argue that the mind is composed of neurons, but the mind itself is not physical. Some dualists argue that this is why you can weigh the brain but not your mind and thoughts. Now others disagree and argue that the mind must be physical even if we don't yet understand how. So, I don't know. It's an interesting question. Alright, let's look at the complementary of a composition and that's division. Now, division is when we move in the opposite direction from the top to the parts, from the whole to the parts. So division is invalidly inferring the quality of the parts from the quality of the whole. It's helpful to think of it as kind of the opposite of composition, or think of it as moving in the opposite direction. Composition moves up from the parts to the whole, division moves down from the whole to the parts. So here's some examples. Water is wet, so hydrogen and oxygen, the parts, must be wet. I am conscious, so my organs or cells must be conscious. The team is great, so each player in the team is great. I am free, so my cells are free. Or assuming the universe does not have a cause, it follows that everything in the universe is without a cause. Again, it's important to remember that it's sometimes legitimate to infer the quality of the parts from the quality of the whole. So for example, the whole wall is white, so each brick in the wall is white. Again, since this is an informal fallacy, like the other fallacies we looked at, you should be sensitive to each case and how the parts and whole are connected in that case and what the words mean. Right? Now, how do you avoid it? Again, be careful when you infer the quality of the parts from the whole. Sometimes the whole is more than the parts, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's debatable. So, here's another interesting question. If the whole is physical, must the parts be physical? Well, I don't know. On the surface, it seems like this must be the case. However, are the smallest particles really physical? How would we know if they weren't? 
Now, Leibniz was a philosopher who attempted to reduce all of reality to something called monads, and they were non-physical. And modern physics, obviously, has something to say here, too. All right, let's do the lottery fallacy. Now, the lottery fallacy arises when we invalidly infer that X must be designed because X is improbable. So, for example, I conclude that Bob must have cheated when he won the lottery because the odds of him winning the lottery were like 20 million to 1. Now, in philosophy, this arises with teleological arguments, or arguments from design, because it's usually argued that the universe must be designed because of the law, because of the laws of the universe, or some things in the universe are so improbable. They couldn't have arisen by chance. Okay, let's discuss these two examples. The fact that Bob won doesn't mean the lottery was rigged, or that Bob was meant to win. Rather, we say Bob was lucky. After all, somebody had to win. So improbability does not always support design. We just say he's lucky. Okay? Now this fallacy, again, is important in philosophy of religion where it's sometimes argued that the life-sustaining conditions of the universe are highly improbable. So the universe must be designed that God's probably this designer. Now it's hotly debated, but this might be a lottery fallacy since some universe had to arise and we're just incredibly lucky, like Bob and the lottery, we're just incredibly lucky that this one arose. Now, however, at some point, crushing improbabilities do indicate design. For example, I would be suspicious if Bob won the lottery every day for an entire year, 365 days in a row. And each day it was 20 million to one odds or something like that. I would infer that Bob's not simply lucky, lucky but he has a system to win or he's cheating somehow. Right? So, still, people can agree that it's fallacious to infer design from simple improbability, but crushing improbability over time is rather tricky. So how do we avoid it? We need to understand that something has to happen even if all possibilities are highly improbable. Now, we understand that someone will probably win the lottery even if each person has a very low probability of winning. So we want to make sure we got that in our head. <laughs> And we want to be careful about jumping from improbability to design. Sometimes it is justified, I think, but not always. And uh, I'll make a video eventually on this. You get into multiverses and so on. So study math, probability, and statistics, and that can help quite a bit. Um, let's do the next fallacy, number 19. This is the appeal to inappropriate or dubious authority. Now, this is when we support a conclusion by appealing to a person who is not an authority on the subject or when we appeal to an authority with whom other authorities disagree. So this is pretty simple, right? So I might argue peace is the best strategy because Albert Einstein said so. But Albert Einstein was an expert in physics, not political science. Hmm. I might say you should take those vitamins because Brad Pitt said they're the best. Well, that's an appeal to a celebrity, kind of like appeal to authority. Uh, here's another one. God does not exist because Stephen Hawking said so. That's an appeal to authority. Here's another one. God exists because the Pope and Francis Collins said so. Appeal to authorities, and so on. You get the idea. Now, if you appeal to an authority, you should appeal to an appropriate authority. For example, you should appeal to an authority in physics if you're debating a topic in physics. This sounds simple, but many of us don't do that. <laughs> now, even appeals to appropriate authorities, I think, can be fallacious. This is because it's not the person that makes a claim true, it's the evidence and arguments that support a true claim, right? For example, Einstein did not make space and time relative, rather he discovered that it was relative. It's the evidence he presented in his works that supports the claims for the relativity of space and time, not his authority, right? So how do you avoid this? Well, one approach is to not trust anything on authority. Oh, well, I can't do that. That's hard. <laughs> This is really difficult because we can't be experts in everything. I trust my doctor in some medical matters. I trust the community of physicists on other matters. I trust my calculator sometimes, though I know I can check its work. The best we can do is carefully research authorities before trusting them. Right? Um, all right, let's do number 20, the red herring fallacy. And this is when we change the subject or give an irrelevant response to distract. So here's an example. Bob says, you really shouldn't charge them 30% on their loans. That's not ethical. And mean Dan says, well, someone else would charge them that rate if I didn't. <laughs> okay. 
This is a red herring fallacy because the fact that someone else would do it is irrelevant to whether it's ethical. Right? We want reasons for why it's ethical or unethical, not just the fact that other people would do it. Hmm. So changing the subject, that's the red herring fallacy. Now, some have suggested that this red herring fallacy is derived from the practice of dragging smelly fish, called red herring, along the ground to distract dogs that are chasing a fox, right? Now, the dogs with the best noses in training would avoid the red herring smell on the ground and continue chasing the fox or rabbit or whatever. The inferior dogs would pursue the smelly herring instead of the fox. Okay. Whatever its history, this fishy story is a nice way to visualize what happens in red herring fallacies. We are sometimes like those deceived dogs, being led astray by interesting but irrelevant ideas. And you may have noticed that the red herring is also very similar to the straw man fallacy. And this is because both fallacies arise when we avoid the original argument, either through misrepresentation, that's the straw man, or by changing the subject. That's the red herring. So how do you avoid it? Well, repeat and paraphrase your opponent's argument before responding to it. That's good. Carefully listen before responding. Also, if you ever feel tempted to change the topic because you have an inadequate response to an argument, simply say, mm, I, need, I need to think about that argument more instead of presenting a red herring in the guise of a real response. Right? Now, of course, this is easier said than done because we're sometimes prideful and want to win the argument now. So perhaps the best way to avoid this fallacy, and all fallacies, is to be humble and emotionally mature. Now, I would do want to say one other thing here, though. Uh, when you study philosophy, it's important to remember that some of the most fundamental and philosophical questions often have contradictory answers, both of which are supported e by equally valid arguments. And you can look at Immanuel Kant for more on this. For example, the question of whether the universe has a true beginning or whether it's infinite may be such a question. I may have a sound argument for a beginning thesis and you for the infinite thesis. When good reasoning leads to contradictory answers, we should dig deeper and perhaps question reason itself. In short, it's not always a red herring for someone to ignore your argument and present an equally valid and opposing argument. We need to be sensitive, in other words, to the context of debate to determine whether the red, fallacy, red herring fallacy is at work. Again, perhaps the best we can do to avoid this fallacy is to humbly and carefully listen to opposing arguments and then directly respond to the premises or inference of those arguments instead of changing the subject, misrepresenting the arguments, and so on. Okay, Okay. the next fallacy, very interesting, is the playing God fallacy. This comes up a lot in ethical discussions. This is when we argue that we should not intervene in the natural course of events because intervening would be playing God. Now, people use the playing God defense when they argue about euthanasia, cloning, uh, stem cell research, all sorts of things. Um, for example, we shouldn't legalize euthanasia because we would then be allowing doctors to play God. That's an example. Now, keep in mind that there may be good arguments against, let's say, euthanasia or whatever, but the playing God argument is probably not one of them. The idea that we should not play God has several problems. First, not everyone believes in God. <laughs> okay. Second, believers disagree about what God wills. That's a problem. Third, many people who use the don't play God defense are committing the appeal to nature fallacy, the first fallacy in this video. And this is because they believe that God created everything with a natural purpose and that we should not interfere with that purpose. This seems to be a version of the appeal to nature fallacy, since the argument is that not interfering in God's creation is what makes something good. I'll make some other shorter videos to clarify some of these points. You know, um, if we have to follow a thing's natural purpose, that really restricts us. For example, the ear. Um, hmm, ears are obviously made for hearing, so it's wrong to wear earrings. Okay. Anyway, I'm digressing a little bit. Let me get back to this. Um, we can identify the central problem with the playing God defense by considering the following questions, right? Are doctors playing God when they remove a patient's appendix or cancerous growth? Is the hero playing God when she jumps in front of a car to save a life? Would a future geneticist be playing God if she removed a baby's 
cancer-causing genetic sequence? Now, I think most people will agree that these are morally praiseworthy acts, even though they're examples of playing God, since each involves interfering with the natural course of events. So, why is it good to play God in these cases, but not others? Reflecting on these cases should help us clarify our moral ideas. It should help us see that we believe it is often good to play God and to interfere in the natural course of events. For that reason, it's fallacious to claim that playing God makes an action wrong. And, of course, another problem with the playing God defense is people often present it when no good reasons can be found, you know, that there's an emotional and empty response. So, I might ask somebody, you know, why is this wrong? They say, it's just, um, you know, you're playing God if you're messing with the genetic code. And then I say, well, what's wrong with that? And they say, there's unintended consequences. But notice their real argument is the unintended consequences, not that they're playing God. They're playing God with sort of an emotional reaction. So, to summarize, I think the playing God defense is fallacious because it's vague. It's a form of the appeal to nature fallacy, usually. Or it's an empty emotional phrase that's really based on God-independent feelings and beliefs. So how do you avoid it? Well, do not speculate about God's will. If you believe in God, use the mind and the conscience that God gave you to discover right and wrong. Right? One last fallacy is the non sequitur. Number 22, this just means it does not follow. It's another way of saying the argument is fallacious or the conclusion does not follow from the evidence or premises. Think of it as synonymous with the word fallacy. Okay, on this slide you can see I have um, a way to organize fallacies. You know, each logic textbook is going to give you different ways of organizing them. That's fine. Um, I'm not going to emphasize that here. I'm just going to move on um, and tell you that in the next video, I'll go over the formal fallacies, which I think, again, are more interesting and very um, applicable and helpful in life, and yet uh, very few people seem to be aware of them. So I'll introduce, uh, introduce those in the